Thank you very much, um, Will and Teresa, for a really lovely introduction. It, it means a lot to me to be back uh, at the New School. Uh, my first teaching job here in 1979 uh, involved teaching a, at the time, um, it's, which what seemed like a pretty out there course called Class and Gender. And, um, and uh, in many ways, the things I'm going to talk about tonight uh, bring me kind of full circle. And uh, I've, uh, I have to say that of all the audiences that I have ever spoken to, uh, the audience that you represent is the one that I hold most dear. It's an audience that I think of as being committed to understanding capitalism as a system, uh, to a deep sense of social justice, and also to a real concern with understanding current events in an often pretty uh, puzzling and, and uh, uh, disappointing um, uh, political environment. Uh, so thank you very much for being uh, with me here tonight. I, I mean my title, um, I, I intend a kind of double meaning with the limits of capitalism. I intend it to be kind of a talk about the limits of understanding reality purely based on that theoretical construct known as capitalism and the need to expand beyond that to look more specifically uh, at gender and at unpaid work. Uh, but also as a comment on the limits of capitalism as a system, what it can and can't accomplish on its own and where, where, um, where it fails us. And uh, in talking about the current crisis, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see as the kind of the long run fundamental roots of the uh, uh, pickle that we're in today. Uh, but I'm also going to talk uh, in some ways going to focus a little bit more closely on what I see as kind of the political stalemate that we're in and argue that feminist theory uh, offers some important ways of understanding and unpacking that um, kind of political dilemma. So this image is kind of my icon. I've used it for years. It was the cover of a book uh, that I published in the early 90s called Who Pays for the Kids? It was uh, designed by the Red Women's Collective in London sometime in the 80s. I've never been able to track down the actual author. It's sort of part of a folk art tradition of, of uh, uh, feminist thinking that I really uh, hold dear. And of course, it's an image of what the work that goes on outside of the factory as the workers that come in uh, to it and then come out of it have their capabilities developed and restored and, and, and uh, kind of processed. Uh, uh, by women workers. Uh, as you know, women do the bulk of unpaid work, but they also are very disproportionately concentrated in the paid care sector of the economy and education and health services and play an especially important role in the development of uh, our human resources. In my view, the, 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 let me just first say this is, I, I don't want to lay claim to the feminist critique of political economy. There are many feminisms and many fe ways of applying feminist insights to political economy. But the, the version that I'm going to lay on you tonight uh, is a critique that suggests that neoclassical economic theory is too market-centric, that it tends to view everything as though it were a market, uh, whether it's a capitalist enterprise or a, uh, a family or a household. But also, on the other side, of the political spectrum that Marxian economic theory is a little bit too capitalism centric. Uh, and that neither of these theoretical paradigms really pays enough attention to the social organization of care work. And uh, you'll see the influence of Marxian theory and political economy in my work, in my emphasis on political struggle. And what I will argue represents a form of, dis of, of collective conflict over who will pay for the costs of caring for all of us, not just the cost of raising kids, but the cost of caring for the sick, caring for the disabled, caring for the elderly, caring for people who can't care for themselves, caring for people who can't rely on the market um, to meet their needs. And I'm going to argue that uh, this is a dimension of conflict that, connect, that intersects with conflict over the surplus in other areas of the economy, but can't really be reduced to that kind of um, uh, paradigm of, of, uh, of, of the surplus itself. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a, a very broad talk. Yeah, that's the, uh, uh, the, the parking lot outside my local uh, organic food store is a rich, <laughs> is a rich source of, uh, of uh, 
photographs for my PowerPoint uh, presentation. <laughs> I, 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 I want to touch on some big stuff, big theory, uh, but I also want to uh, talk about some very specific empirical work and then uh, come around to the, um, the policy implications. So I'm going to give you a little dose of, of big, big theory with um, my perspective on the evolution of patriarchal systems and then move to the mismeasurement of economic well-being and then segue into the current um, recession and as I emphasize the current kind of political stalemate over how to deal with a recession. And I really want to start out by uh, paying tribute to Bob Heilbrunner. I, I've always thought his, his book, I always loved this book in particular because of its grand theoretical vision, The Nature and Logic of Capitalism. And my only quibble with it for years has been that I wanted to add that adjective patriarchal uh, in there in the title. And so um, maybe, maybe someday I, I, I will kind of do that write something with that exact title because I, lo I, lo I, I love the example that Heilbrunner uh, set um, for all of the reasons that, that Will gave in his, his uh, introduction. Uh, you know, back in the day uh, when I was teaching class in gender, sometimes we referred to um, the capitalist patriarchy. And I think that's also an interesting term, but I guess I've come around to the view as, as time has passed, uh, capitalism is now more the noun and patriarchy is more the adjective uh, than the other way around, and that's part of what I'll, I'll try to uh, persuade you of. I, I think there is, to use uh, Bob's uh, word, um, I think there is a logic to patriarchal systems. I think that commitment to children and to other dependents uh, tends to weaken women's bargaining power and to put them at a disadvantage in uh, establishing both political representation and economic uh, bargaining power. And I think, um, that we can actually learn some important lessons from reproductive biology and the, the fact that women often have a lot to gain from marriage in terms of support for the process of raising children and raising the next generation. And I think often as a result end up in many circumstances paying a higher price for marriage or entering into a contract that is somewhat asymmetric in ways that reflect um, the, the uh, uh, reduction in bargaining power attendant on a, great, a greater commitment to the care of children and other dependents. Um, this is an, an argument that I've made at length elsewhere and I, I haven't, I'm not going to go into a lot of um, detail into it tonight, but I think it really lays an indispensable framework for understanding the evolution of, of, uh, of social systems. I think from a macroeconomic perspective we can uh, kind of date the emergence of patriarchal systems with the emergence of settled agriculture and the emergence of private property uh, and that it generated some advantages for patriarchal societies that often allowed those societies to outcompete or, or in many cases extirpate uh, societies that were not organized along uh, patriarchal lines. Uh, you know, there's a, a wonderful uh, story about the myth of the founding of Rome, the rape of the Sabine women that Pablo Picasso um, is picturing here. It's, it's one of the most famous pictures, I mean, it's one of the most famous themes in the history of Western art. You can find um, four or five different versions of it from four or five different centuries uh, in the Louvre. This is just a, a more recent one. It's basically a story in which uh, the Ro Romans uh, needing some women with which to found their city uh, came up with a very clever plan uh, to find wives. They invited their neighbors, the Sabines, uh, to a big party and as soon as the Sabines arrived with their daughters, uh, the Romans uh, mounted a kind of sneak attack and took the women, stole the women away uh, from the Sabines. But then they immediately married these women and got them pregnant. And by the time the Sabines had rallied to come back and reclaim their women, many of these women were bearing the children of um, the Roman men. And they rushed out on the, onto the battlefield saying, stop, this is crazy. We don't, wanna have, we don't want our fathers killing the fathers of our children. It's an incredible metaphor for the way in which women are often held hostage by their concern for their children and for um, uh, the well-being of the next generation. You know, to really make this case and develop it historically requires a lot of attention to detail, but I think there is an emerging body of feminist economic history that really fleshes this story out in some detail, the sense in which the collective interests of men 
and the collective interests of women. We're very much at odds during much of European history. The witch trials are kind of a classic example, and that's uh, uh, what's pictured here. I'm a particular fan of uh, the uh, Marxist economic historian Wally Seckham, whose account of the transition to capitalism really uh, uh, devotes a lot of attention to, to uh, collective conflict based on gender and also based on age. And um, I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of historical thesis that's gained increasing credibility in recent years. And um, I also think there's a kind of emerging literature on the micro foundations of patriarchal systems uh, that uh, often looks at efficiency wage theory or bargaining models to explain why or under what circumstances men might have an incentive to force women to over-specialize in care. There's a kind of liter very important literature uh, in economic theory, the theory of the firm, that describes the capitalist as a residual claimant who gets that basically what that means is the capitalist gets what, whatever is left over after all costs are paid. That gives the capitalist an incentive to cut costs because the surplus, that which is left over, uh, is his to claim. So uh, a lot of Marxian literature describes reasons why this incentive structure might lead to less than efficient results. Uh, among other things, it gives workers in the capitalist firm an incentive to shirk or to resist authority because they're simply being paid an hourly wage rather than gaining a, 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 a claim over the uh, uh, share of the surplus. But also it gives employers an incentive to uh, uh, be very cautious about any technological changes, social or political changes that might increase the bargaining power of workers. Because as the bargaining power of workers goes up, their wage goes up and the surplus uh, then proportionately declines. And there are many aspects of the patriarchal household that can be analyzed in similar terms. When women have very low bargaining power, men can provide them with their subsistence and claim whatever remains. And to the extent in which, to which specialization and care makes it possible uh, to reduce women's bargaining power, it gives men an incentive uh, to force women's over-specialization in those activities, even when that might actually reduce the overall uh, social product so this is not, I'm not going to take this uh, to, to um, uh, any specific conclusions tonight, and I, but I mean it uh, kind of as a demonstration of what I see is the increasing maturation of a field of feminist economic theory that uh, has kind of integrated itself into a larger discourse of political economy. So when I think of the interaction between patriarchal and capitalist systems, I do think of it as kind of two monsters. But it looks like they're fighting, but actually what they're doing is getting ready to mate. Uh, 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 and of course, Mecha Godzilla, I think, is a, a better description of the capitalist system, um, a little bit less organic uh, than the... Uh, actual uh, biological uh, creature. And I, I think actually this is a metaphor that a lot of uh, uh, a feminist political economy has, has invoked kind of the unhappy marriage of, uh, of, of uh, capitalism and patriarchy or you know, sometimes the, um, the, um, the tumultuous uh, uh, divorce. I guess I, I do think of it more as a, as a kind of hybridization and a hybridization that has evolved in a very complicated way over time. And, um, which I think helps explain what's going on today. Uh, the, uh, Teresa mentioned a book that I just uh, uh, published last year. It's kind of a history of economic ideas, and I think it, it, um, I want to refer you to it kind of as a longer story, a longer narrative about how, how long it took women to get permission to be self-interested. Uh, to pursue their own economic self-interest, whether, whether, whether in the economic sphere or in um, the, the sexual uh, sphere. I think we've actually reached in the 20th century uh, a, 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 an almost gender neutral uh, ideology of self-interest, but it took uh, many centuries for that kind of moral double, double standard to be um, displaced and, and, and replaced uh, by a modern one, and I think it's a really fascinating story in and of itself. So here's how the narrative goes as I, as I tell it. I think that the development of wage employment in particular, because it's based on individual wage work, not family work, tends to 
kind of undermine patriarchal relations within uh, the family. Uh, authority over children is undermined, importantly, um, in ways that are, I think, uh, as a, linked to the weakening of authority over, over, um, over women. Uh, women fight for and gain something that they call self-ownership, the right to, to uh, control their own property in marriage, the right to control their bodies uh, within marriage, the, the right to uh, uh, lay legal claim to their earnings in, in wage employment. Uh, women engage in collective action that, that kind of um, is really necessary to move this process along. It's not, I don't want to tell this as though it's a purely economic tale about shifts in relative prices. But I think there is a sense in which um, the uh, uh, development of capitalist forces of production becomes a kind of um, uh, facilitating force uh, for the weakening of some aspects of patriarchal control. But at the same time, capitalism re remains very dependent on the kinds of care that women provide, both in paid work and unpaid work. This is a famous uh, British Airways ad, um, lullaby not included. It's, it's a it's a nice, I think it's a really nice image of the way in which uh, the, the, the maternal ideal of, of uh, concern is kind of translated into a, a kind of uh, picture of high quality care and, and solicitude. Um, for those of you that are traveling first class. Uh, and I think this, this uh, uh, the 19th century is really a, an incredible stage on which a, 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 a melodrama is acted out of, of, of kind of compromise, of, of, of kind of collaboration between patriarchal and capitalist ideologies with the emergence of a family wage concept that men should earn enough to be able to support a wife and children, that women don't need to earn wages as high as those of men because they don't have to support um, a family. Uh, the whole development of a terminology of breadwinners and, and, and homemakers that I've written about elsewhere. But I think the 20th century is a really interesting episode in and of itself because it represents the emergence of a welfare state that in many ways takes on the tasks that were once assigned to women in the family, socializing some of the costs of caring for dependents and becoming kind of the site for the same sort of devaluation and derogation that was once uh, leveled at women. So in my view, and this is a rather different view of the emergence of the welfare state than you'll find within the, the traditional um, kind of left uh, Marxian account of um, uh, its emergence to deal with uh, the side effects of class struggle or the instability of capitalism. In my view, many, many aspects of the welfare state are basically designed to take over or to supplement functions that, that uh, uh, were once performed in families and which become basically not, not viable, not efficient, not, not, um, not effective within families. So, yeah, I don't know where this came from. This is another example of kind of folk art on the web that without a, without a, uh, it's hard to find a particular um, uh, credit to give for the artist, but it, it, it shows up in, a, it's, it's graffiti that shows up in a lot of different places. And the wrong side of capitalism here has to do with the fact that capitalism does not provide payment for services that are not bought and sold in markets. And so, since a lot of the work that women do is uh, basically involves producing human capabilities that are not directly sold um, or bought, um, it leaves women at a disadvantage. So sure, women own themselves. This was part of the liberal rhetoric of, of, of feminism, that women would gain self-ownership. But it, it doesn't really take women uh, very far if they continue to specialize in producing things that can't be owned. Um, and I think uh, one consequence of that is that we see with the development of capitalism a tremendous improvement in the relative position of women vis-a-vis -vis men, but actually some deterioration often in the position of mothers relative to men and relative to other women with increasing kind of uh, what's been called the pauperization of motherhood or the motherization of poverty that's particularly extreme in countries like the United States with less generous welfare states providing a substitute or a, a buffer 
um, for those processes. So we now live in a world in which I think it's, it's pretty common for capitalism to be depicted in masculine terms as a kind of vital, aggressive, competitive, tough force, not just in, in, in video games, but kind of in, in, in the uh, real world. And then the, na the welfare state is kind of, it's actually often referred to as the nanny state, right? So it's, it's kind of treated as a, um, the, the feminine side of the, um, uh, of, of that, uh, of that uh, classical dichotomy. It's, it's weak, it's, it's innervating, it's, uh, it's spoiling, uh, it, uh, it's expensive, it needs to be controlled, it needs to be cut, it needs to be disciplined. And I think that uh, this is a language that is partly a legacy of that, uh, of, of the, the kind of uh, hybridization of capitalism and patriarchy. But it leads to, in my view, a kind of uh, a neoliberal dilemma. It's not the only neoliberal dilemma, and it's not the only source of long-run instability of capitalism, but it is a source of instability because capitalism needs families to produce and maintain human capabilities, but it would prefer not to pay for them. In fact, it's pretty hard to, to organize uh, uh, families in a just-in-time inventory pay per pay for performance uh, uh, system, although some people have theorized it, including the sociologist uh, uh, Coleman. Uh, I think there is an interesting analogy with the natural environment uh, that just as the, uh, you know, as we experience capitalist competition creates some pressures to offload costs into unpriced realms because it's, otherwise it's difficult to compete with other capitalist firms that are doing the same thing. And likewise, um, capitalist competition creates an incentive to exploit resources that are unpriced to the, to the max, especially if to the extent that other uh, 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 companies are doing the same thing. So it, it's basically a category of problem, a problem with common property, with common goods, with the commons, with what economists call uh, externalities. And in the long run, uh, it's not a sustainable system. That is, we can cut public higher education in the US uh, without a lot of adverse consequences to the U.S. economy because we can outsource overseas to where there are more highly educated workers. Or in a pinch, we can always import more educated workers into the U.S. Very, very cost effective, getting the benefits of those educated workers without paying the costs. But it's a little bit of a Ponzi scheme. It's a shell game because eventually, in, you know, in the long run, um, some country has to be producing those workers and educating them or they're not going to uh, be around. Okay, so that's kind of the background. That's the backdrop. That's the theory. That's the logic and nature of patriarchal capitalism. And now I want to share with you what I think are some, some very momentous consequences for understanding of current economic trends. Um, I think there's a, a, a widespread awareness of the fact that we don't uh, typically assign a value or pay much attention in our economic accounting schemes to unpaid work. But I think people tend to assume that the consequences are not all that serious. And I believe the consequences are very serious, both for understanding our economic well-being and also for understanding the political coalitions that, that um, we might uh, hope to form and that we might depend on um, for some prospect for uh, progressive change. So I want to run you through some of the ways in which uh, the mismeasurement of economic well-being uh, contributes to our current uh, uh, political dilemma. Uh, here's, let's start with just the simplest example. Uh, there may, have been many, many examples out there of efforts to construct a better measure of economic welfare than gross domestic product. That is, rather than just adding up the value of all the goods and services that are sold and looking at how that changes over time, that's that green line, GDP per capita going up, you know, that's our harbinger, that's, our, that's what we hear about on the news every night. That's what we're told that when GDP declines, that means we were in a recession. When it resumes, we're out of the recession. You know, that is our, our speedometer, that is our dashboard. That dominates uh, everything that uh, we debate in uh, kind of economic policy on the evening news. But as we all know, there are 
major environmental assets and major environmental services out there that we can assign a value to that are being degraded, uh, if we factor those in, we see um, a much lower rate of growth in what's called here the genuine progress indicator. The GPI is one example of a series of, in of indices that takes environmental bads into account along with economic goods and also assigns a value to unpaid work. Well, as women enter paid work, driving GDP up, they're doing less unpaid work that's typically not subtracted out of our accounting, economic accounting systems. But when you make these adjustments, as the um, framers of the GPI or Genuine Progress Indicator have done here, you get um, a very, very different story. But um, it's even more momentous here than, than kind of mismeasurement of economic growth. So let me make sure that we're all on the same page about this measurement issue. I, I speak about this a lot. And I run into a, 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 a lot of people who agree, oh, this work is so important. Oh, it's just, it's so precious. It's sacred. Of course we could never do without it. But it's not really putting a value on it. Why do that? You know, it, it just, doesn't that diminish it? You know, what does that add? You know, GDP isn't really about welfare. We all know that. It's just a measure of, you know, that economists use. But we all know that it's not welfare. So, you know, why are you trying to add in this unpaid work and pretend that it's really a measure of welfare? You know, and, okay, I'm caricaturing a little bit, which I shouldn't, because it's actually a very hegemonic argument. And I just, I just want to emphasize the other side. If you're interested in material living standards, the market income that you have, that you get, is a fundamental determinant of your living standards. But the time that you have to produce goods and services for your own consumption and the consumption of your family members is also an important determinant of your material living standard. In fact, you could redefine consumption, and we should redefine consumption, to mean, you know, consumption is the sum of stuff that we buy and consume and the stuff that we consume that was produced for our own consumption. Now, this wouldn't matter a whole lot if the only unpaid work that we ever did was just for ourselves. But a lot of the unpaid work that we do is for other people. The people that we live with, the children that we're raising, the sick people that we're taking care of, the elderly that we're caring for. So there are third party benefits. And if this labor were withdrawn, somebody would have to provide it. Else, our standard of living would decline. So I want to emphasize, this is, this is not psychological welfare. It's not happiness. I care about those. I'm interested in those. I'm happy to talk about those. Uh, I'm, nothing makes me happier than to talk about happiness. But, I, but this is different. This is talking about a material living standard and arguing that to have an accurate picture of it, you have to have an estimate of the value of unpaid as well as paid work. So a lot of my empirical research agenda focuses on this issue, especially time devoted to children, uh, but I've recently been collaborating with a group of other uh, economists and sociologists in an effort uh, to put some better numbers on time devoted to care of the disabled um, and the elderly. And I want to just impress on you that the magnitudes of this unpaid labor are really high. And, and the accuracy of the data that we have to describe it is actually uh, pretty good. So the American Time Use Survey conducted every year now since 2003 as part of the current population survey on a representative sample of the US population, very high quality data. What did you, you know, what did you do yesterday? What time did you get up? What did you do? What else did you do? What did you do then? How long did you do it? And then what did you do next? And during this time, were you responsible for the care of a child under the age of 12? It is a very, very rich data source. About half of all of the hours of work that are performed in the United States are unpaid. Now you can call this a capitalist system. It, it has capitalist elements. It's a capitalist economy. But half of the work that's being done really can't be described as taking place within a set of capitalist relations of production. It, is, uh, it has a different logic. And 
this work has really important implications for living standards. We know over time, the data isn't as good historically as it is in the cross section, but we have pretty good data over time for the US for some, from some smaller surveys. And we also have good cross-sectional data from countries at different levels of development. It seems pretty clear that as countries get richer, less time is devoted to housework. But guess what? More time is devoted to children. Even in countries where women are working more in paid employment, more time is devoted to children. And the reason for that is that time devoted to children is somewhat flexible. People re redeploy it. They reorganize it. So yes, they go to work from 9 to 5. They spend more time in the evenings and more time on the weekends because time with children is irreplaceable. There is no substitute for it. Just because your child is in daycare or child care 40 hours a week doesn't mean that as a parent you're spending less time in face-to-face -face interaction with your children, you're actually spending more. And I think that's a, a very surprising and very momentous trend, fact, um, to keep in mind. We don't have sufficiently good data on time devoted to disabled and the elderly to assess those trends. So um, I don't, just there, there's a question mark there. OK, here's, here's a little question to see. This is kind of your little quiz. Um, to see if I've, if I've persuaded you of my argument. Take two families. Both families have two adults and two young children. Let's say they're both preschool kids. And both have a family income of $50,000. Family A has one wage earner working full-time earning $50,000 a year and one full-time homemaker. Family B has two wage earners, each working full-time earning $25,000 per year. Those two families are treated exactly the same in the distribution of income. Do you think they're equally well off? No. no, because that family B has to pay money to purchase substitutes for the services that are being provided by that full-time homemaker. And there are a variety of ways you could put a number on the value of that full-time homemaker's uh, services. None of them are perfect. They're all approximate. But it's really important to put some value on it if you want to understand the relative living standard of those two families. OK, here's where we're going to get a little political traction here. How many of you have heard that inequality in the US has increased dramatically over the last 50 years? OK, it's increased even more than you think it has. And here's why. Because women have entered paid employment in increasing numbers. Now, there's actually a big empirical literature that, tr that asks, what is the impact of increases in women's employment on the distribution of income? But most of that literature, all of it really, pretty much until like the last two years, just looks at market income. What happens to the distribution of market income when women enter paid employment? Well, that can work either way. It's actually kind of an interesting empirical question because uh, women enter paid employment, that brings up their family income, well, it depends how many do it at what time and to what extent high-earning women marry high-earning men. That in itself could have an equalizing effect or a disequalizing effect. I think that the most persuasive empirical work uh, on, on this, just market income alone, suggests that it's had an equalizing effect. That is, that market income is now more distributed more equally as a result of women's entrance into paid employment. But that's because you were taking all these women who were not in market employment before and giving them zero contribution. All those homemakers and housewives got zero. So when women did paid employment, moved into paid employment, you know, that's equalizing the distribution of market income. What if you go back in there and assign a value, impute a value to that non-market work, and then you're asking not what happened when women started working, but when women changed the kind of work they did, right? They changed the kind of work they did from doing unpaid work as homemakers to doing paid work at, in the wage labor market. And just think about it. Um, there's a lot more variation in wages in the labor market than there is in the productivity of women. I mean, it, you know, the, the productivity of nursing a child, it, you know, it, 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 it doesn't go up a whole lot with a college degree. Uh, I mean, there are some differences in child rearing and housework. Okay, you can be a gourmet cook. If you have a great vocabulary, maybe your children will do better on their SAT scores. 
you know, and I'm not pretending that those differences aren't significant. I'm just saying, in general, women's unpaid work was of much more similar value than women's paid work. And so when we, as you move from an, a, an economy in the 1950s where a lot of women are doing, or full-time homemakers, to one uh, where uh, the percentage of women who are employed is very close to 50% of all employment today. A lot of that's part-timers, but still an amazing transformation. Uh, you see that the overall difference in living standards has almost certainly become really much more unequal than a measure based on market income alone. You know, another way to see that is sort of patriarchy was kind of equalizing the capitalism. You know, every, every man had a housewife. If every man had a housewife who earned about the same, then that is every man is sort of adding an, uh, uh, an equal amount um, to their uh, living standard uh, over time. So, okay, so I got ahead of myself. So, uh, but, and, and I, I've done a little, you know, let me just say, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here a little bit because how you measure inequality matters. There are a lot of different metrics you can use, whether a Gini coefficient or a, or a decile measure or a variance measure. And, you know, it's, it, you could get into some really interesting technical stuff. But I, I believe there is some pretty good evidence that, that inequality has moved in, in this uh, direction. And plus, over the same time, um, the cost of caring for dependents have gone up. The cost of childcare, uh, if you're engaged in paid employment, the cost of sending children to college, and uh, the importance of sending children to college has gone up. The increased longevity of the older generation, and now with lower fertility, we have some, uh, fewer siblings with whom to share elder care responsibilities. So, this is also a determinant of your living standard. How many dependents are you caring for and how much do those dependents cost? You know, we have a food price index, we have a consumer price index. We do not have a dependent cost index. If we did, it would show that the cost of caring for dependents has increased over time. So uh, what does that mean? Well, I uh, have argued for a long time that we have some very important potential political coalitions to build in this country around public support for family care, both in the form of tax credits and, and public support for caring for dependents, the provision of public services, work family balance issues like improving part-time jobs. And in fact, we've seen some important gains in this area, including unpaid uh, family leave. But I think that what's undermining this effort is the increased inequality that um, has been exacerbated by changes in women's roles. So high wage women now have a, a uh, this picture of the, of the capitalist system, this picture of the wage pyramid is much more complicated because it's not just about the distribution of income or the distribution of wealth. It's also about the distribution of the costs of caring for dependents. And that has become more unequal and more fractured and more divisive it's made it very difficult to unify uh, women, I think, around a kind of uh, systematic um, political agenda. Uh, at the same time, I think the deterioration of our uh, overall living standards and decline in relative wages has increased people's anxieties about the welfare of their children, uh, the competitiveness of their children, uh, and in ways that I think uh, make it difficult to build a strong coalition around improving educational opportunity and, uh, and health. And I think that is, um, I think that's very relevant to understanding the current political situation. If, if all that was going on in our current polity uh, was a concentration of wealth and income at the very, very top, with everybody else uh, getting worse off, it's very hard to explain why we wouldn't have a stronger political coalition willing to argue for higher tax rates on families with incomes over $250,000. I think the American uh, uh, working class and middle class is divided in some very profound ways along family structure lines, along class lines, along lines of race and ethnicity. This isn't just a, uh, this isn't the only factor contributing to our current uh, political dilemma. There, there is obviously a huge backdrop. There's uh, the effect of deregulation on a global level. There's the reduced importance of national boundaries and loyalties. Uh, there's control of the media and uh, corruption of democracy. There's, there, 
you know, the, we've moved towards a more competitive form of capitalism. That's what globalization is doing. And that competitiveness, that competitive pressure is disrupting a lot of welfare state uh, dynamics. But I do think these factors I've put here in red are also part of the story, that there's increased inequality among women and families. There's increased conflict over the welfare state the cost of social reproduction. And I think that um, that is contributing to a fear of collective action and a opposition to uh, social spending. So there's some painful um, but profound ironies about this. First, I have to share with you my favorite uh, cartoon, which I show in every, virtually every PowerPoint presentation I ever give, <laughs> thanking the cartoonist Norman Dog for letting me do it. Uh, uh, what? is happening with this hybrid system as it's evolving is that the global capitalism itself is undermining a lot of the values that are really central to, to family life. The idea of uh, pursuing your own self-interest, the idea that commitments are for suckers, the idea that uh, you don't really need to share, the idea that caring for people makes them dependent and undermines their self-reliance is a very anti-family ideology. And so this kind of summarizes it for me, you know, it's, we're shipping you to Mexico, it's more cost effective to raise you there. Of course, people don't yet ship children to Mexico, but what they, we have done is shipped Mexican workers here, um, which kind of amounts to the same thing. I think there are some, some interesting uh, twists to the story and some incredible ironies. And um, one thing that's happening is that we've seen as a result of the current crisis a tremendous increase uh, in unemployment among men in particular. Layoffs uh, were much more significant among men um, than women. And there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, discussion in the media about the man session. Have you heard this term, the man session? That in the business cycle, uh, because men are employed in more cyclical industries like manufacturing, when we hit a recession, men lose their jobs faster. But of course, if it were just the business cycle, then men would gain jobs faster on the other side. But guess what's happening in this recession? There's no upturn in employment. Uh, uh, there's no recovery in terms of jobs. And so uh, what we're seeing are some longer run trends. And these longer run trends, I think, are, are really uh, illustrated very nicely in this graph that's just showing comparing employment and manufacturing since 2000 with employment and health and education services. The reason why these industries are interesting to me is that they start out about the same numbers and pretty close and look at that divergence. Manufacturing employment uh, is, is almost 75% male and health and education services employment is almost 75% uh, female. So we're going to see a lot of pressure on gender roles um, coming about as a result of this feminization of the, of the structure of employment. It's also um, reflected in these trends in labor force participation where now you can see that the participation rates of women with a bachelor's degree are better, actually higher than those of men with only a, a high school di diploma. So it's not just unemployment that we have to worry about, but a real um, decline in the ability to get jobs and participate in the uh, paid labor force that has very, very damaging uh, consequences uh, uh, for families and for overall inequality in the US. So this is my punchline. If you, you know, it, I, I think that, uh, that uh, one political effect of increased inequality among women is pretty apparent in the success of the Tea Party and the media play uh, that its advocates uh, have gotten, and I think an even more, to me, an even more disturbing possibility is that uh, we're seeing this persistent unemployment and lack of employment at the bottom of the income distribution is going to have huge legacy effects. It's going to have uh, horrible consequences for the next generation growing up in poverty and unable to fully develop the capabilities that they need to compete in um, uh, today's economy. And that leaves us with some really important political priorities. We really need to publicize and protest um, current unemployment rates. They're, they're, they're inefficient, they're wasteful, they're unsustainable, they're unacceptable. They are testimony to the failure of market forces uh, to uh, rescue us uh, from this uh, recession. 
we really need to document increased inequality, and not just inequality in market income, but inequality in living standards. And in particular, the inequality suffered by women raising children on their own in an economy where they can't find jobs and the fathers of their kids can't find jobs either. And our task has got to be to measure and explain those social costs in ways that can overcome these divisions, in ways that can rally a larger coalition that could help us move towards a more sustainable organization of production and a more sustainable organization of our social reproduction. Thank you very much. I hope you'll have some comments or questions. I've been asked to um, have you raise your hand and then get a microphone before you speak. Hi, my name is Lee Wong. I have a question, and that is, <laughs> um, if we're experiencing such high unemployment rate, why aren't there any people going out on the street to protest? Um, look at what is happening in um, London. Uh, the people, actually the students particularly, are very upset about the um, increment in tuition. But why aren't we doing this? Why? Why isn't there anyone going out on the street and protest? Okay, that's my question. I, I don't know. I think that, um, I wish I did. Uh, I think that a lot of it has to do with, um, a lot of it has to do with kind of the psychology of recession and the psychology of, of uh, people blaming themselves and blaming their own, uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it just has something to do with what, I think the only way you can explain it is by describing kind of a structure of political fragmentation and uh, a lack of understanding of market failure that could prevent people from kind of mobilizing themselves and others. Maybe others, maybe others uh, want to give this question a try. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Heidi Siegfried, and um, me and uh, Noreen Connell, who's a past president of Now New York State, and um, Chuck Bell from the National Jobs for All Coalition, we just started a first Friday vigil for jobs at Chuck Schumer's office from 12.30 to 1.30, and the first one we had was December 3rd, the next one will be January 7th, and this is when the unemployment statistics come out. And they were supposed to be flat this, this month, but they went up two points. So. And we got a little bit of coverage um, in El Diario and different, but we, we want to continue to build this and by having it be a regular first Friday, 12.30 to 1.30 at Chuck Schumer's office. And you know, we may have different themes and you know, but, and this is happening, oh, Chuck Schumer's office is on 3rd Avenue around like 47th or something like that. And um, other cities have, have similar kind of um, protests, usually jobs with justice or, you know, different people. But, you know, it's hard to get, uh, hard to get coverage. And then the other thing is there are a couple of, um, there's the, uh, the 99ers and there's um, UAG, Unemployed Workers Action. And these are uh, people, you know, actual unemployed workers who do things that are more like flash mobs and... <laughs> You know, they do these creative things that use the, the social media, um, but that's all I know about right now. Uh, I think, I Nancy, uh, Rick McGahee was uh, one of those long time ago uh, students. This is a fascinating analysis, or a head is spinning. So I want to go back to this idea that particularly with the aging of the population, you've got this huge cost of social reproduction that's not being met, actually, that all the claims on the government budgets are saying is going to get worse. Right. Yet from your presentation, uh, as women continue in the workforce, it seems very hard to kind of pull on that cord. So if you could just try and spin that out some. Uh, quality of care declines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I, just, I was really struck by this idea that these social costs of reproduction just aren't in a family with children, but really bringing this idea of uh, the depend dependence. Do you know, are there organizing things among that coalition of workers? But also the consequences for the economy if that doesn't 
go? Can the firms just, can capitalism just kind of keep dumping that cost out? Well, good, good question. I guess we'll find out uh, uh, as we age. <laughs> um, uh, but it, it, is, it is real testimony to uh, – it, 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 it is real testimony to kind of political divisions because you would think that with a growing cohort of people who are moving towards old age uh, that um, – and, and a de declining supply of unpaid labor available to help uh, tend to that, you'd think there would be a greater interest in collective mobilization in that direction. And I think there is. I think uh, the support for Social Security remains pretty strong among voters. And um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting discussion and debate about pension reform that Teresa could 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 weigh in on and, and talk about. But the, 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 uh, the weak spot in the whole elder care scenario has been paying for long-term care. And the, the health insurance bill included a private insurance program, the CLASS Act, that could, be, could turn into a cost-effective way of financing long-term care. But it seems increasingly unlikely that it, that it will do that. Um, so, it just seems to be the case that people are weighing the two possible strategies. And one strategy is, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a cost benefit analysis. Am I better off increasing my own savings and fighting for lower tax rates and just trying to take care of myself and my own family? Or am I better off pooling uh, risk in this public insurance uh, system? And as you know, there's a giant amount of ideological warfare against the idea of pooling. And I think that our task really is to take that on. And I mean, our, ta our task as economists is to really show the, the tremendous efficiencies that can be gained through an effective risk pooling system, which is what public uh, insurance is. And uh, I really think the economics profession in the United States deserves some of the blame uh, for uh, kind of a, a methodological and theoretical bias that's made it very difficult, that hasn't encouraged uh, uh, that kind of research. Hello, thanks. Um, I just want to thank you for your presentation. That was great. Uh, my name is Sunshine Letter, and um, I'll just quickly try to add, as you were saying, to the response to why aren't people on the streets, maybe one other element. I mean, this is just something I've thought about is, the increasing criminalization and state violence towards street assembly and protests that we've seen, at least I've seen over my lifetime. Um, I don't know if that's one element possibly adding to just yeah. not having a desire to, to throw yeah. out into the streets because you know the consequences are becoming more and more severe. Um, but two questions I had for you. One was the, the Tea Party mention. Mm -hmm. I was just curious about a little more ex explication of, about your thoughts of how this connects, the, the details of how this connects to your thoughts about the Tea Party um, yeah, movement. The and the second question I have, which is a, a different question, is your thoughts about political strategy around the alternative economic measures. I've thought some about, you know, the alternatives to GDP, yeah. like meaning getting them actually used in, in yeah. public and media yeah. discourse, et cetera. Yeah. I guess I think the Tea Party, um, uh, there, there's been some debate over what percentage of members of the Tea Party are women. There was an article published uh, last spring claiming that 55% of its members uh, were women. I, I don't put much, um, I think that's, it's very ambiguous how you define Tea Party membership, much less. Uh, figure out its demographics. I do think understanding the demographics is is pretty important. But I think the political visibility of women in the Tea Party in the last elections was really striking. And that uh, a lot of women, uh, very, and I, I think Sarah Palin among, among them, uh, really do have a pretty strong following um, among women voters. Uh, and I think that following is really based on a very anti-state, uh, very, very kind of, uh, we're better off taking care of our own families and not having to worry about other people's families is a very much a part of the, of the I mean, they don't say that, uh, but I think that is kind of the, the subtext of what they're arguing. It's very strongly anti-tax. It's very strongly anti-government spending. It's opposed to health insurance. It's, ve it, it's very targeted at the welfare state. Uh, and I, I guess that's why I, 
you know, in some ways that's kind of what inspired this talk is that I felt like, gosh, there must be something going on that can explain this particular fractionation that is going. Now, it may not persist. I hope it doesn't. I think, I think political, these pol political coalitions are very unstable right now and very tippy. I, I don't know uh, what, you know, where the uh, future lies, but I, I am pretty sure that class and race conflicts are greater now among women than they were 25 years ago. Can you, can you respond to the GDP measure? Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, um, there are a lot of people working on alternative GDP measures. There's actually, op the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis is open to the idea of developing satellite uh, household accounts. I, I, don't, I don't exactly understand why they haven't gotten more traction. It's partly because there's a proliferation of them and people can't decide among them. And so uh, that indecision uh, create, makes that GDP remains this focal point. It, there's just a lot of inertial momentum uh, behind GDP. I guess I just feel like more people should say no, say no to GDP. You know, you know, c call up and you know, let, let's have protests. Let's let's have street protests against GDP. Uh, 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 I mean, people should just be writing in and saying GDP. This is a bogus measure. Why are you using? I mean, to say the recession is over. With unemployment over nine percent and going up, what's wrong with that picture, right? To say that 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 a recession, you know, that we should define the business cycle in terms of the rate of growth of this, of this, of this, this construct that's really been, uh, in many ways, successfully challenged among. Uh, uh, economists and social scientists, yet it just remains the arbiter. I, I don't know. We, just, we really need to rally around that. Uh, someone asked me about, any, uh, you know, why is there more race and class inequality among women? Well, part of it is the success of feminism within a capitalist system. It's that hybridization. It's that, you know, it's that interaction, you know, that women have gained more education. Women have moved into professional managerial jobs. Uh, and a lot of women have not. A lot of women are at the very bottom of the income distribution in, in um, low wage, child care, elder care, retail jobs. So the inequality of earnings among women is much greater uh, uh, than, you know, than it was then. And uh, in my view, inequality matters. Inequality affects people's uh, decisions about whether they want to pool risks with other people, whether they want to redistribute income with other people, whether they want to join up with other people. The problem is, of course, is that inequality breeds inequality. And it becomes a circular process, very, very difficult to, to interrupt. It has its own, its own momentum that we really need to understand better in order to combat it. One reason that um, GPI is not in the lexicon is that women's poverty is not in the lexicon. Um, single women and elderly limit women generally li live in poverty. Um, but when President Obama talks of his commitment, he talks of his commitment to the middle class. That's true. And uh, <laughs> I, I think it's because he, uh, you know, we, I, I think that the, the, the kind of f fracture of, of collective interests in the U.S. today has people hoping to make an alliance with people above them at the expense of people below them. Uh, and I think people are, are terrified at what's happening globally. They see that the, the U.S. is losing its position in the global economy. They see that real wages have uh, basically stagnated uh, for most workers and certainly for workers without a college degree uh, and they see very little potential to change the overall structure of inequality in that environment I think their instinct their impulse their affinity is to try to identify with people above them rather than people below them and um, uh, what can we do except try to understand that and try to talk them out of it and try to reconfigure it and try to give them an expanded sense of possibilities and 
and potential for, for uh, uh, reorganizing things in a more sustainable and egalitarian way. But I mean, if you say, like, to name it is to claim it, it, it hasn't even been named. Well, it's not that it's not named. I mean, I mean, people go around naming it all the time. It's just that they don't get, they don't get traction. They don't get people behind them. You know, there you could, uh, you can find a lot of. Uh, I mean, I've been writing about poverty among uh, 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 mothers for 25 years without getting very much attention, either in the media or in the economics profession. It's not that people don't. It's not that there's not num there aren't numbers. That there, there's not research out there. It's that there's not rage. There's not rage out there about it. Yeah. I think the people with the mics, if you want to speak, you have to get the attention of the people with the mics because they're the ones who are kind of controlling the, 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 the process. For that, that's kind of the technology. Uh, Hello? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Hi, so it. my name is Ross Slav. I'm a student over at Parsons, and I particularly wanted to ask some questions about this notion of unpaid work in response and kind of to a project that's currently run at Parsons called the Desis Lab. And so one of the things that we studied over the summer was this concept of social innovation, which begins to happen when traditional kind of systems begin to collapse and fail. And so the project that I worked on over the summer was the kind of beginning of the demise of what you could say the Lower East Side elderly healthcare system and the closing of the senior centers that happened as a response of funding cuts from Albany. And so one of the things that we were studying was the ways in which social innovation, which is how small communities then begin to self-organize and solve kind of their own problems. We went around looking at what was happening. And then one of the professors who was, you could say, doing research on the project gave a critique that I thought was kind of very frightening in thinking about this, which is that as more and more people kind of stop relying on what you could say the welfare state and the government and funding comes out and they start solving their own problems, what incentive is there left for government to then bring that back in? And so then what happens when people start solving their own problems and kind of without the support of money, how do we then maneuver that when that gets back? And is there anything that can be said about that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I guess I, personally, I feel like I wish we had that problem. That 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 is, if I if I thought people could self-organize their way out of out of uh, the shortage of elder care and poverty, uh, I would be a happier person, um, and um, would probably stop being an economist and do something a lot more fun. Uh, uh, I do think that self-organizing is very powerful and, and, and that there is a lot of potential there, but I think it needs to be combined with public support and, and, and risk pooling and public insurance. And, uh, I, you know, hopefully, you know, you, you, you can, you can, we all can learn something, um, even from our worst failures. And uh, I think new ideas are often born out of necessity. So. I guess I, I'm very enthusiastic about efforts to that are kind of more decentralized, self-organized uh, efforts, not just uh, for elder care, but also for developing cooperative businesses and developing more community-based economic development streams. I think there are a lot of ideas that we can be pursuing and developing, but I don't think any of them are going to uh, be successful without uh, some public commitment uh, to supporting them and encouraging them. Uh, so uh, I really like the description of what you're doing, and I think I, I, I hope it turns into a really good, healthy, successful, good hybrid. Oh, go ahead. You could do it. Go ahead. Um, thanks for the talk. It's, it was really great. I just wanted to get a clarification, because you went over your interpretation of the welfare state as it differs from others really quickly. Yeah. So if you could just exp expand on that for a second. You were kind of saying that you didn't agree that it was the outcome of class struggle, but that it had some functionalist yeah. kind of dynamic to it. So if you could just kind of elaborate on that, I think okay. it would be helpful. Yeah, I guess I, um, I do have a kind of headlong tendency as a speaker. Um, so let me backtrack a little bit. 
I think there are a lot of reasons why the welfare state has emerged in all of the advanced capitalist countries. And I think part of it has to do with regulating market failures, including the kind of failure of the financial system that, that we've just lived through is really a crucial part of uh, state regulation. I think uh, regulation of environmental uh, travesty is also a really important explanation of, of state action. I think unemployment insurance in particular as it emerged in the um, um, uh, 1930s was very much driven by class conflict and fear of the tremendous instability that resulted from high unemployment rates. But I also think that if you look at a lot of what we spend money on in the welfare state, a lot of it is caring for children and the elderly. And a lot of it is caring for children and the elderly in a better way than families could do on their own, providing education, providing health, uh, providing services that are far superior in, in quality and much more cost effective than what we could do on an individualized uh, 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 family basis. And also just better from an insurance point of view. Uh, I mean, sure, you can rely on your children to support you in old age, good luck. Um, if your children uh, come to New York and go to the new school and become artists uh, <laughs> or even economists, uh, you're, you're going to have to get a pretty big chunk of their paycheck to pay, your own, pay for your own food. Uh, uh, you know, people can't, there are just, uh, I think that there are tremendous economies of scale and economies of scope in social insurance. Uh, and uh, so I guess I don't, I kind of cringe at the word functionalist. It, maybe there is a, kinda, a little bit of a functionalist, the functionalism there and the idea that, yeah, I think it fulfills a function. Uh, but I think people fought for it and expanded it because they felt that it improved our collective standard of living and that um, there just needs to be some appreciation of, of the, uh, 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 of, the, its connection to families and, uh, and to unpaid work uh, in, in, the, in the whole story. And that's often lost in the, in the, the kind of classic literature on, uh, in political economy on the emergence of the welfare state, you will not find mention of the word family. In fact, a lot of textbooks of public finance, look at, look up, try to look up women or family in the index and you won't find it. Uh, it's, as though, it's as though it doesn't exist. It's kind of, it really has been rendered pretty invisible within that field of economics. Hi, Nancy. Larry and Angelo. Um, I think the, the lack of rage, um, and, and, and the Tea Party as well, is a function of the fact that we haven't called the question yet because we haven't balanced the budget. So, you know, Obama comes in, he takes office, money flows to states and localities. There are minimal layoffs in just those areas, education yeah. and health. So we got through that one for a couple of years. You know, the Democrats lose the midterm election. There's a lot of rhetoric about how much we hate all these services. Nonetheless, you're not seeing a lot of cuts yet and if the, the last round is any indication, when you want tax cuts for the rich and an extension of unemployment, you basically get both. And you just let the deficit increase. Now, I mean, you can't do that forever, but so far, you know, we've gotten through with, with only minimal irritation because we have been willing to allow the deficit to grow. Now, um, a Tea Party local guy in Nassau County, um, basically did the same thing. He did tax cuts, did not cut the budget, and they're in bankruptcy. So, I, I mean, I don't know where it'll end, but, but as of right now, we'll just, you know, let the deficit rise and just see how things go. And that may change once um, we can't do that anymore. Yeah, it's kind of like Ponzi, it's like Ponzi political finance. It's like, instead of Ponzi finance, you just, you see these political problems coming and you just, figure out a way to move them into the future, right? And, and it may well be that that's what we're doing and that, and that uh, the day of reckoning has just been postponed. I, I think that's a very interesting hypothesis. And I hope it's true. 
Well, speaking of the day of reckoning, uh, first, thank you for that wonderful and lucid analysis, which I totally share and agree with. And then I, my question is maybe the, the $64 eternal question, but it goes to the heart of um, how the Tea Party has stolen the rhetoric and how and what you think about the way you talked about rage and being and terrifying and those words that really do get to the heart of the matter and how has terror the security state the fear mongering that yeah. is full time by the the government as as many as much as other sources um, rerouted the analysis to be one that's about securing our own individual future, our own individual child's future, rather than a social um, kind of solution or a po pooling the risk, as you framed it. It's just, it's sort of like the Titanic. It's like playing, it, it's like playing, uh, it's like playing table tennis on the Titanic. It's just really hard to see. You're on a boat. You can't really, it's dark. You can't really see where you're going. You can't see the icebergs. You know, in theory, they're there. What you see is that you're competing with someone in the stateroom and they're winning, you know, and you, and you know, and you want to drink and you, and you, you know, you just, it's just less visible. Uh, and I think that is a, I mean, there's a whole history of human responses to catastrophic events that suggest that, that you know, that's a pretty, uh, you know, endemic problem. Uh, and the, so, you know, how do we do it? How do, you, how do you shine a light on it? How do you make it visible? Uh, I think it's, you know, it's a task that requires, unfortunately, or fortunately, or neither one, I don't know. Economists don't really know how to do this. Like what we're talking about is not, it's not really about economics. It's about communication. How do you communicate uh, to people? How, how do you give them a picture of what, uh, you know, of the, of the dark waters and of the risks of, of running uh, full speed ahead with this misplaced confidence in what we're doing? I, I, I think that's something that we all have to turn ourselves to and, and think about, but it's not something that, that I feel like I have any great special expertise in, in, in doing. Um, I think it's also a question for all of us to have not the dark waters, but a different shore. Yeah. You know, to, to say, well, there you go. Else to go for. That's right. Yeah, no, I like the different shore metaphor. I think that's good. I'm not, an, I'm not an economist. I'm an historian, but I read Paul Krugman and where I get most of my economics from until I come to wonderful things at the New School. But isn't he saying very much what we've just been talking about in this last 10 minutes about the shore that's there and nobody is looking at it, nobody seems to be caring about it? Yes. I, and I, we're going to pay the price, and our children are certainly going to pay the price. Yes, I, I, I would say that my assessment of uh, uh, the, in particular, the tax deal that, that uh, the Democrats just signed on to and what its consequences will be politically in the long run, I, I, I very strongly agree with Krugman on that. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Marion Lipschitz. I graduated with a master's degree in anthropology from the New School in 1981. I think your analysis was terrific and very relevant to me since I'm currently underemployed. Uh, but I'm going to shift the context a little bit back to globalization and neoliberalism because I recently went to a human rights conference. Uh, it was sponsored by Rabbis for Human Rights North America and it put my own dilemma into a rather different context because what one of the plenary sessions talked about there was the fact that there is now more slavery 
in the world than ever before, including um, more than when we had 19th century chattel slavery in this country, that it is having disproportionately horrible effects on the lives of women and girls who uh, get forced into trafficking. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could um, comment as an economist, because some of the solutions that were proposed at that conference about corporate social responsibility and microcredit and allowing you know a little girl to raise a cow so that someday she would then have a herd and it would lift up the whole village seem to me not to be um, sufficiently comprehensive. What, what's your own, what is your own vision of what should happen? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure the, you know, I, I would say I'm, I, you know, my own economic philosophy is social democratic or democratic socialist. I, 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 I think that you were certainly going in the right direction when you, you talked about women's unpaid labor. Um, I, you know, I, I think what I'm saying is, is, is partly on the heels of what the pre, one of the previous questioners talked about in terms of fear mongering and the erosion of civil liberties and the, you know, the erosion of human rights as a consequence of the globalization. More, you know, uh, maybe a revolution at the World Bank because their thinking on this hasn't been very adequate either. I guess I feel like um, uh, anything that we can do to try to develop a more collaborative and cooperative and sustainable set of economic policies in the United States could also potentially have uh, positive effects uh, in challenging a kind of the kind of downside of global neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I take your point that we need to be thinking. Uh, not just about ourselves, but about the the, the world as a whole. And uh, the, there are a lot of symptoms of increased conflict and increased instability on a global level that are, are very disturbing. Nancy, I just uh, want to say thank you to you. And um, you can tell that your subject brought a lot of breadth to the questions. Is there any question you'd like to ask yourself to bring your um, talk to a close? Uh, no, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> and I'm, I'm